You may be seated. Kids, you're dismissed. We met in the back. Well, good morning. Thank you for coming out today. Thanks for being at our church. If you're visiting, a special welcome to you. Uh, again, I know it's been said, but we do have a potluck right afterwards. This is one of my favorite potlucks because it's uh, an ice cream competition. So, uh, and I love ice cream, but we, we have some amazing flavors. I kind of got a sneak peek back there, sampled some before. Um, but anyway, I hope you can make it out to that. Uh, before we look at God's word together, I, I just want to encourage you, and this isn't something that we're legalistic about, and it's so, but, but we're a, we're a Bible-believing church, and what that means is we believe that this is the word of God, it's inerrant, uh, without error, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you, we do have the scriptures that come up on the screen, and that's for your convenience because we read a lot, um, but I want to encourage you, if you have your own personal Bible, uh, to maybe bring it on Sunday, so just that you can circle, underline, highlight, uh, make notes. For me, throughout my life, that, that's meant a ton uh, to, to go back and say, wow, 10 years ago I was struggling with this, and that this verse meant something to me. Um, so if you don't have a Bible, let us know. We have uh, ones we'll give you. They're commentary Bibles with notes on the bottom. Uh, we, I read from the ESV. I love that translation. I like the NASB as well. Um, but again, some of you have different translations, and that's fine. But I just want to encourage you to think about that, something that you can study on your own. And then I wanted to highlight somebody, too. I don't know if he's still... Is Alex still in here? Maybe. He, he's in the back. So, so Alex, that guy right there in the back. Everybody look at him. Um, so for two and a half years, our church is about two and a half years old. Every single week, without missing one, Alex has made the slides for the sermons. Uh, so let's give him a round of applause. That's a lot of work. And um, yeah. So hasn't missed one. And, and so with that, we have so many just people here who love the Lord, who love the church, who are serving. And I want to invite you too. if you call this your home church, if there's areas where you feel like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm gifted or I have interest, we'd love to talk to you about how you can serve and bless our church. Again, it doesn't have to mean you're up here preaching or singing. There's so many things you can do. So I want to encourage you with that. Uh, but with that, let's pray and look at the word of God together. Father, I praise you and I thank you for everyone in this room. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ here. Lord, I thank you that unlike every other religion, and every other place of worship, Lord, you call us here not on our merit, not on if we've had a good week and we've done good, but we can come here broken with sin, with failure, with anxiety, with doubts, with questions, and you still call us to come. Because the hope here is not that we've been good enough to be here, but the hope is that you are good enough and that you lived a perfect life and you died the death that we should and you rose in victory and that victory can be ours. And so I pray that that hope would resonate in this place this morning in our hearts as we all come here with failure, with baggage, with doubts. Jesus, would we see you? Would we love you? In your name we pray. Amen. Man. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 28. We're going to look there, and then we're going to look at chapter 31. This is our last week in the book of 1 Samuel. It's been seven months as we've gone through this book. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to finish up this morning. Then next week we're going to do a standalone message, something that's been on my heart. Uh, and then we're going to look at the book of Ephesians. It's in the New Testament, uh, and I'm excited to look at that. It'll be a change of pace, and uh, hoping that God works in your heart and mine as we look at that. But before we read, I, I want you to think about this. There's going to be a day, probably in a place very similar to this, where it'll be planned carefully. There, there'll be money that's spent. There'll probably be flowers. There'll be a slideshow. There'll be people that have planned out what the service will be like. But the crazy thing about this service is it will be about you. But you won't be there. What am I talking about? It's going to be your funeral. That someone's going to get up there. They're going to read your obituary. They're probably going to grieve. They're probably going to be like, well, I can't believe I'm the one doing this. And a pastor, maybe like me or somebody, will, will coach them and say, hey, get up there. Uh, try your best to read it. If you can't, just let me know, and I'll come up and help finish reading it for you. But they're going to get up there, and they're going to begin to read. And they're going to talk about the, the, the day you were born. They're going to talk about what you did for a living. Uh, they're, they're going to maybe highlight things about you, uh, things that you were good at, or how generous you were. You know what? They were always like this. So they loved to go fishing or whatever. They liked Chick-fil-A. You know, they're going to highlight those things. People are going to laugh and giggle. People are going to cry. But the thing is, is that day is coming for all of us. 
Unless the Lord comes back, the Bible says the one thing you can count on in this life is death. Right? And that is the thing that is... Con- I know we have the phrase that the, the two things you can count on are what? Death and taxes, right? But, but even taxes, you can evade taxes, right? You can run from the... You, you can do all cash. You can hide that. You can fudge the number. I'm not saying you should, but you can, right? And there's other things that we say, no, the, uh, my family is constant, but, but they're not. Family can break your heart. They can leave. They can t- talk bad about you. Some of you are like, well, you know, real estate in my home. And, and you have seen Gone with the Wind? Remember that famous phrase? I know we're going way back here. Uh, but there's a famous phrase where the man, he says, do, do you tell me, Katie Scarlett O'Hara, that Tara, the land doesn't mean anything to you? Land is the only thing in the world worth working for, worth fighting for, worth dying for, because it's the only thing that lasts. But the reality is that's not true. There's this thing called erosion. If you've studied science and stuff, right? In California, we have forest fires where houses get burned. You may not be able to pay your mortgage. Land doesn't last. The the, the really most constant thing that you can count on in this life is that you're going to die. You're like, why did we come? Let's go to one and all down the street. Why are we here today? But it's a reality. And I think the problem is that most of us, we go our lives trying not to think about it. We try to block it out. We try to think about happy thoughts, right? Just ignore that. But there's moments like funerals. There's moments where we lose loved ones, where we are reminded of it. We get diagnosed with something that scares us that that day might come sooner than we thought but we try to block it out. There was a man named Jonathan Edwards. He was a great pastor and theologian uh, and writer. And and he wrote these 70 resolutions for his life. And and they're beautiful. You should read them and look them up after this. But, But the weird thing is, as you read these 70 resolutions, you see the theme and the overarching mindset of all of them is death. Let me read you a few of them. Resolution number six says, I'm resolved to live with all my might while I do live. What's he insinuating? That a day that's going to come where I'm not going to be alive. Resolution 7. I'm resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hours of my life. What's the focus there? That a day is going to come where I'm going to pass away. Resolution 17. I'm resolved that I will live so as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. Resolution 9 is probably the the most dark and interesting as he says this I'm, and remember this is a pastor this is a man of God he says I'm resolved to think much on all occasions of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death what he's as much as I can I'm going to make it a point in life to think about that I'm going to die imagine his wife at a dinner party just, just shut up. Be positive, right? The kids are in the piano. Stop talking about death all the time. You know, like, you think, what's wrong with this guy? But the thing is, is the Word of God over and over and over again reminds us that you need to be soberly aware that a day is coming. And we're going to be a man who is soberly reminded that it's coming, and, and God said it's coming in 24 hours. And so I want to ask three questions this morning for you while you're alive. Hopefully you're alive if you're here. Um, three questions of what do I, that we're going to ask, what matters while you're alive? So with that, chapter 28, verse 16 of First Samuel. At this point, if you're here a few weeks ago, it was a crazy chapter because Saul is in distress because the Philistines are coming. He goes to a witch, right? Not a good idea, but he goes to a witch and he says, hey, can you bring up Samuel from the dead? If you want to hear more details on it, you can look at a sermon from a few weeks ago. But he, the witch brings up Samuel, and so Saul is seeking advice from Samuel, really from God. And so Samuel says this in verse 16. He says, why do you ask me? Since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy. The Lord has done so to you as he's spoken by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Look at this. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow, right, next day, you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. Now that's a heavy thing to hear from God, right? He's saying, hey, tomorrow you're going to die. 
right? If it were me, I'd be thinking, okay, God, like, are you talking old earth creation thing? Like, not 24 hour days? Are we talking thousands of years? Is that what you're saying? A thousand years to God? You know, like, well, I try to, but God's like, no, your day has come, Saul. It's heavy. It's heavy, and you say, well, why would God tell Saul that? Well, if you've been with us over the last seven months, you see that Saul over and over and over again has had time to repent, had time to turn. God allowed David two times to spare his life and for Saul to see it, but he never repented. He kept seeking his own kingdom, his own will, until finally God has said enough, and that day is written. And see, for all of us in this room, I'm going to guess that most of you didn't go visit a witch yesterday, and somebody came up and told you you're going to die today. I'm going to guess that didn't happen. So, so how is this relevant? Well, even though we may not know the exact day we're going to die, the Bible says a day is coming. How are you going to prepare for that? Let me read you this text. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. That means that there is an appointed day and time in which you will die. That God knows. That heaven knows. That it's written. I think for so many of us, we hear that, and you're like, man, that's a negative thought. <laughs> like, like, how is this good? And, and so many people struggle with this concept of death and believing in God, because death is excruciating. If you've lost a loved one, you know it hurts, and you're like, this doesn't feel natural. This doesn't feel right. God, how, how could this be? And the thing is, God didn't create death. In the beginning, in the garden, there wasn't death. There wasn't sin, there wasn't corruption, but what happened? Because man sinned, part of the curse of sin is that brought about death. It wasn't part of the original plan. Let, let me read you this verse in Romans 5:12. It says, therefore, just as sin came to the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. It's not natural. It wasn't part of the original design, but it's a result of living in a fallen, broken world. And so we have to live with it. We have to think about it because it's a reality that's written. But see, what so many of us do is, is we learn coping mechanisms with this. And the coping mechanism that so many of us are used to is, what do we do? Just don't think about it. Just don't think about it. Just, just, just get focused on your life. Just get focused on the present, the here and now. I'm going to live my best life, my best self right now. And I'm going to kind of block those thoughts out of my mind. Yeah, I'll go to a funeral, but I try to forget it. I try to just, just bury it and think about the present and now. I keep myself busy. How many of you are just busy all the time? I, I want to keep myself busy and distracted with this life. And the Bible says that we have an enemy, that he loves that. It says he's blinded the minds and the hearts of people, right? So that you don't think about the gospel, because what does the gospel tell you? Death is coming, you need a savior. And so he wants to keep you busy and distracted with life so that you forget this reality. But the problem is, over and over and over again, scripture says it's coming. Job 14.5, speaking to God, he says, Since his days are determined and the number of his months is with you, you have appointed his limits that he cannot pass. A limit is appointed a day. You can't debate it. You can't argue it. Doesn't matter how much keto or diet you do, right? Doesn't matter how many essential oils, how much you exercise, what your 5K is like, a day will come. And it says that life is short, Psalm 90, verse 10. The year of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, maybe 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Psalm 139, 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your books were written, every one of them, and days were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. James 4, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life for your mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes? What an encouraging start. You read this, and you're like, okay, where are we going with this? And if you're a Christian, you should be thinking, well, death isn't the end of the story, Right? That's the good news, that it's not over with death, that we have a soul and we're a body and the soul leaves the body. And you're right. That's what scripture teaches. And even if you're not a Christian, there's reason to believe that's true. You know, there's been studies done throughout the years of people who have died very briefly and come back to life, right? Where someone's resuscitated and they use little things on them, you know, and they come back. There's a term for those things. But anyway, they do that. They come back to life. And there's been a study done of, hey, what was it like? You were dead for a couple of minutes. What was it like? What, what did you see? And, and what's weird is some scientists say, well, you know, when you're dying, your mind starts shutting down and you have hallucinations and it's just is what it is. That's part of, you know, everything just shutting down. But the problem with that is as we've looked at hundreds of people throughout history, there's common things that they all see. One of the most common is this, that you see all throughout people who have died for a few minutes, is they say, they all say, it's the weirdest thing. It's like I've come out of my body. 
and I look down at my body and I look at the people around me and it's like I can see the whole thing. There's my body, but I'm not in it. And if you're a Christian, you're like, hey, that makes sense. Because why? Because you have a soul and a body. And so we leave the body, right? That, that's no longer where we're at. And, but the second most common thing, then they say, well, then it's like I'm in a tunnel and I see a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm heading towards that light. Like, whoa, that's crazy. Most of them, it, the story stops there. But the thing is, the Word of God says that, yes, there is more after death. But that's not necessarily comforting. Because... Jesus, the only person that's ever resurrected and came back from the dead, he says, yes, there's something more, uh, but you should actually be afraid of that. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew verse 10, or chapter 10, verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, for him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Remember our verse in the very beginning, Hebrews chapter 9? It's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes what? judgment. See, the Word of God says that you will see a light, and that light is the Son of Man. And you will see Him in all His purity, and all His glory, and all His majesty. And if you're going to go before Him, and you think that you're going to say, hey, in all your glory, and all your beauty, um, I've been a good person, so you should let me in. And you're going to say, well, you know what? I, I donated to the right charity. I was part of the right political party. Uh, I went to church. I, I gave to the church. I was nice to old ladies as they walked across the street. Like, I've done all these good things. Jesus says, unless you're perfect and holy as I am holy, there's not a chance. The only answer, the only response that any one of us can ever have in that moment when we die and see Jesus is what? You are my Savior. I can't. I'm not good enough. I'm not pure and holy like you. But I put my faith and trust in you. I believe you died on a cross. You rose again. And you are my victory. You alone, not me. That is the only hope. And if you've been coming to our church for two years, two and a half years, and you're still thinking that, hey, because I go to church, because I do good things, I'm ready to die. No, you're not. The only hope you have is did you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Did you repent of your sins and believe in Him? And I want to make that clear. So my first question this morning is, are you ready to die? I'm not saying like, yeah, I'm ready, you know, maybe at the pot like I'll eat too much ice cream and fall out. Like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, are you ready that if it did happen, that you've put your faith and trust in Him, Jesus Christ alone? That's our primary message here as a church. That we're our church called Redemption Bible Church. Redemption means freedom from sin. How do we get freedom from sin? Jesus Christ. Are you ready to die? And, and, and if you know that, you don't got to be afraid of death. Look at David, Psalm 23. We read it last week. What does he say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of what? Death, I will fear no evil. Because why? Because I'm a good person? I'm good at with slingshots and killing giants? What does he say? For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, David didn't know the name Jesus yet. But he understood that my only hope when I die is God. And for us, who is God? It is Jesus Christ. That's your only hope. And that's why Scripture, over and over again, 1 Corinthians 15, it says, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, what? Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here today, you don't got to be afraid of death because there is more. And what more is that you're going to see Jesus. And if He's already your Savior, you get to look forward to seeing Him. That's the hope. And that's the hope we give people who have lost others. Right? Some of you in this room, you lost people you loved this week. I'm meeting with somebody on Tuesday who they lost someone they loved. And they're like, how do I reason with this? Well, what do we say as Christians? We read in verses like 1 Thessalonians 4. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who have died that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. There is hope for lost loved ones. There is hope for you. Death is not the The curse does not win. Jesus defeated the curse. Are you ready to die? That's the first question. The second is this. What will your life be about? What will your life be about while you are alive? Now Saul, he was given 24 hours to live, right? Now, now what shocks me about this is if I were Saul and I was told, hey, you're going to die tomorrow, would you still go to work the next day? 
Like, how many of you, if you had that scenario, you know you're going to die tomorrow. Like, some of you are like, no, I'd go skydiving. I'd eat pastrami chili cheese fries, not worry about the acid reflux. Like, I'd just go ahead. Or maybe, maybe you're more mature than that. You'd be like, I'd write letters to people. I'd make things right. I love people. You know, I'd sell some stuff. Whatever. Like, you do something different. And that's what Jonathan Edwards was getting at. He's like, what, if you know that you're going to die, and that's in your mind, then how you live your life is going to be radically different. But see, for so many of us, we know the day is coming, but we don't change anything. And we don't live like it's coming. Look at Saul in 1 Samuel 31, verse 1. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel. And the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Geboah. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. And the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Milshishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul and the archers found him and he was badly wounded by the archers. Again, why is Saul even there? You'd think he'd be like, okay, God, I get it. You know what? Fine, I'm going to die. I surrender. Give David my kingdom. I'm going to stop fighting. I've seen those little uh, you know, white clay Greek houses on the beach in the Mediterranean. I'm just going to go retire over there, and you just take the kingdom. Just spare me. But unrepent. It says he grieved in chapter 28, but then he keeps doing what he was always doing. He's fighting for his kingdom. And look at what happens in verse 4. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. This is the end of the book of 1 Samuel. And it ends on tragedy. The emotion that this should evoke in us is just deep, sadness because here was a man who had great potential called by God to be king gifts gifted by God chances to repent and change and he didn't see the problem with Saul is death was coming but he didn't live his life thinking that death was coming God called him to live for the kingdom of God but instead Saul lived for his own kingdom and we can do the same can't we we can do the same yeah, God, I know I'm made for your glory. I know I'm made to live for your kingdom, but I want to live for mine. And that's what Saul did. Time after time after time. God, it's about me. It's about what I want. I've got to keep the people happy. I've got, I got to keep my king. I can't trust you. To, I can't wait to trust you to fight the battle. I've got to handle it. And then, God, you want me to just throw away money, but the more money I have, the better my kingdom looks, the more things are established for me. So I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to take what I want. And you say you're going to give my kingdom to somebody else? No, it's mine. And rebellion after rebellion after rebellion because he's fighting for his own kingdom and it cost him his life. The verse, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6, I think explains this concept to us so well. Paul is talking about heaven and he's saying that's a positive thing. And so he says this in verse 6, we are always of good courage. He's saying after thinking about heaven. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. So he's like, while we're alive... That means that we're not dead and in heaven with him. Uh, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He's saying sometimes you'd rather be in heaven with God than on this life. He's like, that, that happens. Uh, verse 9. So whether we are at home or away. So he's like, whether I'm alive or I'm dead in heaven with God, which is really more alive than here. Uh, whether Either one, he says, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And notice a couple things there. He says, while I'm alive, my purpose is not, I make it my aim to please myself. I might get my aim to, to gain as much wealth, have as much fun, have as much stuff over here, much comfort, much safety as I can get, uh, and make my life as long as I can, because that's what it's about. He says, no, while I'm here, my one purpose is to please the Father. And then he says, one day when we die and we're with him, we're all going to be judged. But notice, Paul's talking to Christians. So you're like, wait a second, I thought when I go to heaven, I don't get judged because of Jesus Christ and I'm covered. That's true. He's not talking about that judgment. But there's a moment where you're going to go before the throne of God and people are going to be there like, hey, what did you do with your life? You're saved by Jesus Christ. You're given gifts. You're given resources. I made you. I formed you for my glory. Did you do that? And even if you utterly failed, Jesus covers you. You still get to stay in heaven. But there's, there's an element here where it's God saying, hey, what you do? What you do? And Paul's saying, that's how you got to think. That's how you got to think while you're alive. Because Saul didn't think that way. It's my kingdom. 
It's about my life, and I want it. I'm going to hold on to it, and I'm going to grab it and take everything I can because it's mine. Matthew 16, 24 says this, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Look at this. For whoever would what? Save his life will what? Lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Jesus spelled it out so clearly. He says, while you're alive, the purpose of your life is to live for me. I created you for my glory. I created you that the world would see a light and that that light would be me. I've created you not for yourself, not just for what you want, but so that I would be lifted up. Are you doing that? Because if you don't, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. And this is so easy to do, isn't it? Look at one more long passage. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And look at this. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Hey, what's your life about? That's the second question. What's your life about? What are you going to be known for? What are people, when, when they get up there and they read your obituary, what are they going to say? They were great with money, man. They, they had it, you know, they had that figured out. They worked a lot. They were really hard working. Those are good things, but they're not ultimate things. Years ago, I knew a guy who was a big dog guy. Um, and I'm, I'm starting to like dogs more. There was a season in my life, so don't leave the church because I said, so I, I, do, I do like dogs. Um, but they were that family where the dog was in the home with them, in the bed with them kind of thing. You know, it was just part of their life. And, and God bless them. That's fine, right? Um, but, but so eventually, they, they had their dog, him and his wife, but they had two little boys, right? A two-year-old and a five-year-old. Uh, so eventually, the boys were like, hey, we need another dog. We need another dog. That'll make us happy, right? And the dad's like, all right, I want to make my kids happy, you know, whatever. Uh, so they buy an additional dog that's now in the house, right? Right? Uh, and that, that wasn't a big deal. But then they found two little kittens in the neighborhood that they didn't have a home. So then they're like, well, we can't just leave them here to die. So they bring the kittens into the home. So you got two dogs, two kittens, two kids. Right? Okay. Small home. I think it's like 1,100 square feet. Um, so they're there. But the problem is, is animals sometimes get territorial. And do you know how animals mark their territory? So all of a sudden, the dogs are competing with each other. One dog's like peeing on every wall and every piece of furniture in the house. But then the other dog has to retaliate and do what? Pee on everything other in the house and more, right? But then now the cats are territorial too. So now the cats are at war with the dogs and they have all t- so there's just urine everywhere, right? My, he, he, well, my friend didn't have a lot of hair, but if he did, he'd be pulling it out. And he was like, I don't know what to do. How do we handle this thing? This is, you know. And then the two-year-old got so stressed that he started peeing again and he wasn't potty trained. It was a mess. It was a mess. But why I'm saying that story is from the outside looking in, it's ridiculous, right, on, a, on several accounts. But, but, but the dogs don't own the territory, My buddy does. He paid the mortgage. He bought back when real estate was affordable. He bought it, right? It's his house. Dogs don't own the bedroom. Dogs don't own the furniture. But but looking in, you're like, it's ridiculous, but they're animals. That's just what they do. But see, how many of us from God, angels, heavenly beings, look down on us, and we're just living our lives trying to mark our territory? I'm going to make my difference. I'm going to show that this is my little kingdom. My job, I I climb the rails, I'm making my spot, my mark in history, I'm doing my thing here, and that's what matters. I need other people to show it. And God's like, look, it's all going to be gone. The world is passing away along with its desires. If it's not done for me, it's not going to last. But we can get so fixated in this life and what we're doing that we forget what really matters and what's to come. I've been to a lot of funerals. I've done a lot of funerals for people. And I've done, I've done funerals for wealthy, wealthy people. And I've done funerals that they are well-traveled, wealthy, prestigious. But then I've done funerals for people who are poor, not well-traveled. They can't even pronounce Yosemite or anything like that. Like they, they, you know, they're both funerals. At the end, not much of it matters. And that's why Scripture says in Philippians 3.18, for many of whom I have often told you, now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is their destruction, their God is their belly. Notice that. That instead of living for the kingdom of God, the kingdom I live for is what satisfies me. 
They glory in their shame with mind set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Christ Jesus. I want to pause for a moment this morning and ask you again, what is your life about? If someone from the outside looking in looked at your life, what would they think? When they look at how you spend your money, would they see that that's a person that saves and spends money on themselves or others out of gospel generosity to further the kingdom of God? When they look at your life, would they see you as someone who fought for holiness and had conviction for righteousness? Or instead, your, your, your pursuit of the Lord was lazy and your pursuit of pleasure was far more? Would they see the way you loved people sacrificially? Would they, would they, or would they see someone that, no, I, I spent my life on my career and my image, so much so that it cost me my family, or I didn't have time for the Lord, or I didn't have time to serve Him because I was too focused on me and my things rather than God. I, you know, I've been to a lot of car shows. I'm a car guy. And some of the saddest moments are when you go and you see this really amazing classic car where it's like a guy's put $150,000 into these things because some of them cost that much money and much more. And you see this guy, and it's his pride and joy, and you start talking to him. And as you start talking to him, you're like, okay, what, what does your wife think? He's like, well, you know, uh, that didn't really work out because I was in the garage and working so much. But then my second marriage didn't really work out either. Okay, what do your kids think? Well, I didn't really have time for my kids either or whatever. You know, but, but let's get back to the car. Look at, oh, but see, look at this, the chrome and this. And you can tell his whole life has been about his career and his car. And it's a sad thing, and it's not that uncommon. I'm not saying you can't have fun cars. I, I love cars, right? But what I'm saying is, what's your life about? And it's not just for when you get to heaven. It's also for your own happiness here on earth, isn't it? Because guess what? Uh, Saul was a miserable guy. He was miserable. Troubled all the time. Why? Because he was living for his kingdom. And when you're living for your kingdom, you've got to hold on to your kingdom. You've got to protect your kingdom. And that's where anxieties come. That's where depression comes. Because you're constantly like, i got to hold on to this. What if I lose this? What, what, what if I can't? Hold on. That means you have to be a slave and work super hard to build your kingdom. Instead of saying, God, I trust you that you can work. It's no, i got to handle this myself. And it brought Saul misery. Where are you with that? Third question. What will your legacy be? The word legacy means to pass something on to someone else or to others. But most consistently, if you look at it in the dictionary, um, what comes up is it says passing on of property or money. And that certainly happens, but that's not all legacy means. Legacy means what are you known for? How did you impact people? When they think about you, what, what changed? What did you leave for them to think about? And the tragedy of Saul, I think it's verse 5 of chapter 31. When his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon a sword and died with him. Then it says 6. Thus Saul died, and what? His three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw the men of Israel, they fled, and Saul and his sons were dead. They abandoned their cities and fled, and the Philistines came and lived in them. The tragedy is Saul's sin and rebellion didn't just affect him. It affected everybody around. Jonathan was a righteous man, a man of integrity, a man of courage. We read about him. He was a godly man, but he's following his father. Israel was a kingdom of God. Like God, God. They were his kingdom people, and now they've fallen to the enemy. Your life has impact on others. Do you know that? It's not just you. That's why Scripture all throughout consistently talks about how you live matters because others are watching and are impacted by you. That's what a legacy is. When you go, what will it leave? What will they think? How will you have changed the world? Look, look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 10. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. That's saying that you have the ability to cause people to stumble. Mark 9, 42. Whoever, talking about children. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and were thrown into the sea. 1 Corinthians 8, 9. But take care that his right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. You can cause people to stumble. You can cause people to pull away from God by your actions or lack of actions. 
But conversely, you can do just the opposite. Philippians chapter 2, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. It's saying, hey, as you as a Christian, you shouldn't be like everybody else. Everybody else is complaining, grumbling, negative. You should be different because you have Jesus Christ. And when they look at you, they should be like, what's different? You can say, hey, it's Jesus. One more, one more. Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. How many of you in your life are actively thinking about what legacy am I leaving? Because Saul wasn't. Just think about himself. And he brought a nation down and his sons who were righteous. Maybe for you, you don't think about your non-Christian friends, your coworkers, your neighbors. You don't think about what kind of example you leave. And God has called you to be a light in a world that desperately needs light. But instead, you're too busy focused on your career or your lawn and them not putting their trash cans a foot over into your space or whatever it is, and you're a terrible example in that. You don't want to share the gospel. Maybe for you, you're like, well, my kids, I love my children. I want, to be a good, I want to leave a good legacy. But your focus is I love them so much. I want to protect them. I want to show them that I'm here for you. I'm not like grandpa or grandma. I will be here the whole time. But the problem is, will you be there the whole time? Because you haven't appointed a day to die, right? You cannot be their savior or their anchor. You have to show them, hey, I'm not going to be here forever. Their only hope is Jesus Christ. You've got to look to him. Or, or you're like, I want to give you everything that I didn't have, so I'm going to spoil. I'm going to give you all this stuff, but now they're focusing on material things and things other than God, and, and you've wasted your time with them. I knew a student who his dad was extremely wealthy, and his dad was extremely generous to his kids. And he taught his kids all the time, I'm going to give you this. You want a new truck? You want a new car? I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. You know what happened to the son? He's a mess. Because now the son's whole life is about material things and possession and work. He doesn't know Jesus. His dad caused him to stumble. In your own life, how are you impacting your kids? Are you being a light? Because what you compromise in, your kids will do in excess. Do you know that? Are you showing them, hey, I'm not just, not just talking the talk, I'm walking the walk. I believe in this. Maybe for your spouse. You're so used to, well, I'm just disappointed and I don't get what I want. You don't listen to me like I do. You don't give me the things that I want. And there's these negative things that I wish you weren't like. And so you, you've gotten to this pattern of just disrespect and anger or, or, or stonewalling. And especially, especially for the men, you're called to lead your home. And that doesn't mean you lead by, we're going to live in this house. I'm going to do this job. We go to this restaurant. Leadership in the Bible is always like Jesus who sacrificed himself for the church. Are you leading your home in such a way where you tell your wife, hey, you know what? I want to serve you. I want to fight for our marriage. I'll be the first to apologize. I'll be the first to ask for forgiveness. Hey, we need to be in church because we need a Savior. Hey, we need to show the kids that we pray together. Are you leading and leaving that kind of a legacy in your home? Or are you even at church with your friends? So many people go to church and they don't come anymore because they're broken hearts. They're like, I went to church and those people were a mess. And they hurt me and I don't want to come back. Are you growing spiritually? Are you growing using your gifts so you could bless the people around you? What will your legacy be? See, a day is coming. What are they going to read about you? What are you going to say? I want to tell a brief, brief story, a couple applications that we'll close. But there was a man that went to this Lutheran church for, for years and years. His name was Pastor Mel. He was a pastor. And uh, I was thankful for him because when I first came in to preach at the 930 service of the Lutheran Church, a lot of people were skeptical. They're like, who is this guy, non-denominational? Are you like a hippie or something like that? Like, what, what's going on here? But Pastor Mel had heard me preach, and he said, you know what, I think this kid's all right. You know, let's just give him a chance. Um, the guy was about 93 years old. And uh, so I, I'd gotten together with him several times. We built a relationship. He, he would always say, hey, come over, let's talk. But it would really be, take me to the grocery store, take me to the cleaners. Take, you know, so I did that, you know, drive around. Uh, but eventually, uh, right before Mel passed away, I was preaching a sermon at 930. And, and so I preached a sermon. And usually after every sermon, Mel comes up. He's like, hey, you know what? You did a great job, buddy. You're, you're doing great. You know, the gospel center, all that. But this time I preached a sermon. And afterwards, there was the most troubled look on his face. Like, he just looked distraught. And I'm looking at this guy like, oh, Mel, what I do? What I like? Did I say something wrong? I know I can, get, get, I can go off script and say ridiculous things. Like, I, I didn't think that happened. But, but he's like, no, Abel, you didn't share the gospel in the end. You didn't preach the gospel. I'm like, well, Mel, what do you mean? The last five minutes of the sermon, I, gave a, I told people about Jesus and the cross and the gospel. And he's like, really? And I was like, yeah, what, you were sitting in the front. And he's like, well, I, my hearing aid went off the last ten minutes. <laughs> 
And, and I tell, I'm saying that story because what was so beautiful about that is you saw his heart. With Mel, the thing that mattered was Jesus Christ. I want him to be shared, him to be proclaimed, him to be known. And that's how he lived his life. And that's for all of us. Can people say that? Will they say that about you one day? Hey, they're the cry, the heartbeat of their life was Jesus Christ. That's the call for all of us. That's the legacy that I want to leave. That's the legacy I want you to leave and our church to leave. I want to be people that we are aware that death is coming, but we're also aware there's a Savior. And we've put our faith in Him and we want to share that. And are you doing that in your life? We have cards right in front of you that say pray, love, and share. On one side, it's the gospel. Take one of those if you don't have it, because it talks about here's how you can intentionally tomorrow start trying to love and share the gospel with the people around you. Uh, there's so many things you can do. If you want to start making a difference in a legacy, start loving your family. Start living sacrificially. Start uh, forgiving, caring for. Start serving. Start living generously. Start praying and say, God, how can you use me for your kingdom? I don't want to live for mine. Are you doing that? Are you surrendered to Jesus? If you don't know him this morning, you don't have to be afraid of death. If you know him, and I want to invite you, I'm going to pray right now. You can believe in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today. Thank you for the communion we're about to have and celebrate what you've done for us. What I pray, if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know you, that Jesus, they would surrender their rights, their freedoms, Repent of their sins and say, Jesus, I have sinned. I know death is coming. Would you forgive me and be my Savior so that when I die, I see my body. I go through that tunnel and I see that light that's you. I see my Savior and not my judge. I believe, save me. And may the rest of us, Lord, may the heartbeat of our lives be you. May we cry out nothing more than Jesus Christ. Would it saturate the people around us? Would they see the grace, the love, the gifts of the Spirit come out and be loved by you? Your name.